fully on the information from this talk without contracting a healthcare professional in your immediate area. So without further ado, we're going to get into some of these questions. I get a ton of questions from y'all through the direct messages. I ask permission to share them um, and answer them on these live streams so that we can share the journey with those learning opportunities together. And a lot of times in these comment sections, y'all start asking a ton of questions about how to relate to stuff that you're seeing in your daily life. And I can respond. Um, I'm not going to, if you put the questions into the Q&A section, I'm not going to get to them. Um, I'm not going to be able to see them. There starts to be a lot of questions that stack up in the comments section. So and I already see them, some stack up there. So just know that I'm not going to get to them. I feel bad someone spending energy doing that. I'm not going to see them. And if you're not comfortable sharing them openly, go ahead and just send me a direct message and I will ask permission to uh, use them here on these live streams and, and get rocking with you so we can all, all do that together. Be blessed. Yeah, rock and roll. Love how you break it down and make it easy to digest and understand. It, you, I'm glad that that comes through. Been doing this for a while and supervising for a while. I have a lot of experience explaining how things work to supervisees and folks who are you know, learning how these things function. And I think um, at the end of the day, it does not have to be as complicated as a lot of folks make it out to be. Sometimes it does get pretty complicated and dynamic, but when it comes down to it, you know, I mean, a lot of these things, uh, we, we can really decentralize th this information a lot more. Oh, thank you, man. Bless for life. Um, okay, I'm an empath. How do I set boundaries? Um, I was married to an abuser for 27 years, a narcissist for 27 years. So when you say you're an empath, so you're kind of identifying as someone um, who feels very strongly and compassionately with other people, and just you know, want to remind y'all that that is a very popular way of thinking about things. It's a very pop psychology concept. I'm an empath, but it, um, everybody has empathy unless you legit have narcissistic personality disorder or uh, antisocial personality disorder, and then th that empathy is going to be missing. Um, however, that is pretty uncommon statistically. Now. Having a, identifying as an empath, you know, lets me know that um, to some degree, it's you, you feel bad when you set limits because inherently, when we start setting limits with other people, um, they're not going to be uh, uh, as validating back with us. People prefer to be shown what they want to see, and a lot of times, when we're setting limits, especially those that are in our best interest, people that are takers. Is, you know, especially someone who has a narcissistic personality disorder, but really anyone who has a lack of self-awareness and is acting out of their own narcissistic wound, which everybody does to some degree, that's just a basic part of, of human nature, is um, they're going to be uh, prone to uh, taking bulldozing over that. So if, if you are identifying as, as an empath or someone who feels very compassionately with other people, um, it kind of goes back to this old saying where if, if you're a giver, you need to set limits because takers rarely do. Um, and that's this is where I tend to, to come back to for this. So in setting clear boundaries, the, the more clear, the, po the better. They need to be measurable, they need to be observable, and you need to follow through with them. And for someone who's identifying as an empath that you kind of feel other people's pain with them, wherever that came from for you, I just need to remind you that setting boundaries is not an event, it's a process. It's ongoing. It's, it's always happening with other people. We're saying what we're okay with and what we're not okay with. And if, if you're identifying as an empath, you feel bad when you remind other people of this, be prepared to remind people of what's okay with you and not okay with you on an ongoing basis. That is, that is part of our job and responsibility of teaching other people how to treat us. Oh, thanks for the love, y'all. I'm glad it's continuing to, to make sense. It does not have to be that complicated, some of this stuff. Um, not that it's not hard in the moment and feel uncomfortable, but conceptually, it just doesn't. It doesn't have to be that complicated. I'm a victim of emotional abuse for eight years uh, from a narcissist. That, that, that can be very, very difficult to heal from and move through, dealing with all those power and control tactics of coercion and manipulation uh, that we talk about on these uh, power and control wheels, learning how to... Uh, live your own life on your own terms and not having these hyper vigilant responses to assuming these things are, are happening in times afterwards, even, even when they're not, as part of that trauma bond, is it can be tricky to get through. Well, I hear you. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am, of course. What are we doing here? I don't know. 
Like a, you, you get, you can name it. I'm not. Uh, I think we're, we've all been co-constructing this space. I'm not going to pretend that I get to name exactly w what it is that we're doing. I, I call it sharing the journey. Um, and at the end of the day, kinda, we're all just walking each other home. <laughs> it kind of might sound morbid, but dude, we're in like the black colored shirt too. Um, we're, we're all going to die one day, and uh, li living our lives uh, meaningfully and seeking truth and understanding together. Uh, as a village and, and hunting as a pack, that, that's what human beings do. So whatever, whatever you want to call it is all good. I'm honored to be a part of folks making meaning in a healthier and more affirming way of their humanity. We can empower ourselves and save the world in, in our own little pockets when we can, where we can. Um, have a good week. You too. Thank you. I read Pia Melody. It was so helpful, but I need the next step to thrive. Please, I am scared to get professional help. Well, I would encourage you to. I've, uh, I'm a big fan of that old concept that you should follow your fear. Um, and I think with human beings where we're so uh, social and uh, shame being the experience, you know, also where we're unworthy of love is follow your shame. Like do whatever you feel like you're going to be ashamed of or what would make you uncomfortable or feeling judged by other people, whatever you're scared of. That is where human beings tend to have the most room to grow. We come from pretty anxious primates. Uh, our, our evolutionary track from eons back. Uh, we, we hung out in the caves for a long time. So, um, you know, that uh, that that fear, that discomfort, that risk of looking stupid and feeling stupid, at the end of the day, is is a buy-in at the table, for living the life that you want to live, and we we get to decide whether we're going to pay that buy-in every day. And it's, everybody can afford it. Narcissistic or Aspergers, right? I hear I have run into that a lot in couples work. Um, guys. They have high functioning guys with Asperger's that you know don't have any emotional resonance and um, female partners and then them having more of an Asperger's presentation once once they realize how they're coming off and they're they're like holy and they're totally dismayed with themselves once they realize what it is but then the I've also worked with some folks and seen some spaces where I got in there I was like huh this guy might might have Asperger's and when I start explaining what's going on they like double down on their assholery and I'm like mm -mm, I know what that is um, you make me feel comfortable in my skin and let me know I'm okay you are normal we're all weird so like what's normal I don't know nature nature um, rewards biodiversity and uh, you hear me talking a lot about trauma and, and the prevalence of this, and I think it's something that w the, the research is just starting to, to understand. And a lot of you know, peer-reviewed research is hitting the books about it. In that, um, it's the great common denominator b between so many people and a lot of folks that don't even realize that they have it going on. And if we can start seeing where we came from in the frame of those experiences and understanding how much we all have in common of just experiencing basic human pain. And, and suffering and then the, the proponents for it and the ability for us to connect with each other is, is that much higher, which is what we really need at the end of the day if we're gonna turn this whole humankind thing around. So all, I'm seeing like 60 messages packed up in the Q&A section here. Again, I feel bad someone being like, type in your really thought, well thought out questions in there. Um, again, if you can just put them into the comment section uh, openly, I'll be able to see them. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, again, then send them to my DMs. Um, I finally set boundaries and she discarded. It's okay. Your, your gain, right? It's like, what do I do if they set, if I set boundaries and they leave? You win. Because they were never for you. I joined late. What are we talking about? <laughs> Whatever you want. Um, I'm also as well gaslighting. Okay. Uh, I finally set boundaries. You started. Tell them point blank that you are taking yourself out of their cycle. I'm taking you out. Yeah, totally. Or you just say nothing. And, and uh, you know, I'm just not going to interact with you like that and, and let, it, let it speak, especially after you've engaged a bit and they know where you're coming from. I'm taking myself out. And then, and then acting like it, right? Start starting to teach them that what you, what you say is exactly what you're going to do, and you should expect that. 
What's a good way to address reactivity that stemmed from physical abuse? Learning to ground your central nervous system. You need to relearn how to do that. Um, if it's you know, physical abuse, it's really at, at some of the most fundamental levels of uh, trust and, and, and distrust in, in your environment. Um, so the, the, reactiv uh, the reactivity is gonna be coming from your, your body physiologically on a very primal level. So the, uh, most of the symptomatology I would imagine that you have is probably physiological. And, and that's gonna start with a lot of mindfulness practices. I wouldn't start, don't start with meditation. I think a lot of times like, okay, well I need to ground myself. The most effective way to do that, as said you know, through research is to meditate. But Western culture doesn't really compute that well with meditation. Like, like Zen Buddhism meditation, which is really amazing craft, but like you know, monks spend their whole lives in, in, in monasteries practicing to do that shit. And, and, in Western culture, it's all about like, go, 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 fill gaps. We just like sit on a pillow and think about a candle and like you can't, Westerners can't do that. It has to be a, a much slower introduction. And then as, as you develop the capacity to hold those types of mindful states and your neurocircuitry develops and you get more comfort and grounding your central nervous system, you can move more into that stuff. But start with mindfulness. Generally, um, any kind of mindfulness approaches are um, like a, a a, a westernized version of an old meditation practice that probably goes back thousands of years to the Far East somewhere. There are tons of different ones. Um, I'm not going to get into something about cultural appropriation and this place and that place and all this stuff about, about healing human beings. What makes it easiest? They play the same playbook over and over again. If they play the same playbook over and over again, they're super consistent, then it's easy to to, to move around it. You, you, you just don't engage in their games. A lot of people are kind of like, how do you respond? How do you respond? A lot of the stuff you don't respond. You just you turn back in and, and let your own shit shine and rock it and vibe out with people who are going to align with those values and what you have moving and can have some reciprocity back into you. I'm too easy. I, I hear you. That tends to be a lot that, that makes it makes it really, too, I'm too easy. Uh, I don't mean, I'm not, I don't want to... Um, you know, validate you saying that you're too easy or agree with you in saying that you're too easy, but you're, you're describing like the mindset that goes along with, um, you know, making it too easy for people to F with us. You can't, there's a, a lot of times people, Western culture also has, is very mistaken, I think around compassion and kindness and, and what that is. You know, a lot of times people think you're supposed to be passive or something like, and it, that's that's not, that is not operating from from the power of love um, that, that that enables people that that uh, holds people hostage to over functioning um, you know, figuratively but it's, it's not uh, and it's not kind to ourselves it, it, it is active self-harming any thoughts on loving being an RN and attracting narcissistic personalities yeah um, set better boundaries and um, how I would think about that for you is, uh, is I think you said like being an RN being a registered nurse like and I don't know what I, I run into in my clinical practice like you registered nurses first of all like thank you for dealing with humanity through this last wave of bullshit that we've drug you through um, but also the, the rate of folks who grow, of, of, of folks who are nurses that grew up in an emotionally neglectful homes that just kind of compulsively over function and stay busy and compartmentalize their own emotions and, and really almost live vicariously through healing other people in a very kind of beautiful way, but it happens so much more often I'm seeing in clinical settings, is I want you to think about it like this when it comes down to your own relationships is you always have to win the battle for structure in so far as your standards. Like, are you willing to participate in this or not? Not are, are they gonna leave or not, not are they gonna say they like you or not? 
fuck them and what they're going to do. Are, are this, is this okay for you to participate in? And you get to choose that. And if, if you want to choose to participate in it, then you can love freely and insist that sometimes they win the battle for initiative. Insist that they're going to try as hard as you try. Don't go out there winning the battle for initiative all the time. Make sure that they scratch the line with you and aren't going to sit you with the hot potato of the emotional wellness um, and, 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 and feasibility of this relationship because that's not a healthy place for you to be. And, and it will be, leave you prone to pursuing and burning them out and burning yourself out and, and making things complicated and, and hustling for your own worth and making yourself attached probably to somebody who is not very nice to you. And that's not how givers deserve to be treated. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, energies are going to collide. And, and however uh, the, those dynamics settle out is what will happen. It's not necessarily being the, the, uh, the nice person in the sense always being giving doesn't uh, mean that nice things happen to you all the time. You, you have to insist that you're being nice to yourself, too. Hey, I love your content. Cool. Awesome. Glad you like it. 56, just starting my journey, sort of. It's cool, 56, rock and roll. Best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Hell, let's do it. How do you find the rock star therapist? How do you find the rock star dope ass therapist? D go on a lot of first dates, like dating. Go on a lot of first dates with no, therapists, obviously. Any therapist that you check out to see as a therapist and they'll date you is obviously a dud for being a therapist or being a partner. Um, now, as what I mean, like go to a lot of first sessions um, and see who you vibe with, and and someone is gonna rise to the top, uh, just like dating. How do you get away from one from an abuser? My partner is, and I don't know how. Eighteen years is too much. Is it you don't know how or you don't know when? You're saying 18 years is too much. I hear you talking about identity and your identity, not what is happening in that relationship. I want you to check out our playlists on trauma bond and healing trauma and go to the link in the bio and read some blogs and, and think about what you want in your own life and what you get to control. Because uh, it, it, 18 years is a long time, uh, but you, you might have to, that can only mean so much if you are ready and willing to do something about that. It can be fusing to, confusing to, to pull that trigger and to think about doing it, but there, there's a lot that, that you need to, to be willing to look at directly and, and confront within yourself uh, before you're going to be, be willing to, to do it. So let's go ahead and start ingesting that information. I am out three months now, but this was the sixth discard. Yeah, you're going back and forth pretty good. Hey, from Cleveland. What's up, Ohio? How's it How's it happening? What's popping? I just saw your TikTok. Parentified. That's me. I feel you. That's me too. Oh, we're a part of it. Um, and it, uh, some comments are funny. It's like, that's like so much of Gen X. Like Gen X. Da. And it, it, it's kind of a funny argument. It tends to be a very uh, conservative. Like a, it's a, kind of a right wing prone tend to be kind of argument about that not judging either wing like it just, the, uh, um, the each I, I kind of see as an observer each side or whatever tends to make certain types of confirmation biases it is what it is um, but it tends to be from from that you know, side we'll say oh, uh, well that's all a gen x and a part of that is is true like a lot of gen x is pretty i did deal with a lot of emotional neglect because in the states a lot of us are raised by boomers who are usually raised by farm people. I mean, think about it. Some of us were raised like in a city or like in a, in a, in a Bay Area with really dense metropolitan and, and, and cultural vibe going on that has a lot more gender fluidity. But for the most part, we were raised by farm people. And with that, cool, awesome stuff about like farming. Like we all have like self-sustaining farms and could grow food and not lawns but the, the the traditional social and cultural parts of that come with all the the, the traditional gender uh, expectations in preparation for that stuff um, and it also comes with corporal punishment uh, being you know spare spare the the rod spoil the child bs that uh, you know, do a lot of healthier ways to do tough love jesus I get attached way too easily. If 
if you get attached way too easily, you need to be more attached to yourself. You're, you're looking for something, you're desperate for something, you're chasing something that's outside. You need to find that in here and hang your hat on that. And then once you align more with this and start living your life in that direction and, and really fall in love with those rhythms, someone's going to really have to show their value and worth and willingness to have reciprocity with you. And you're not going to get attached too quickly because because you're um, you're going to be a lot more confident in your own wings. You're not going to be looking for some branch. Three before marriage and three after marriage. Oh, my gosh. So much back and forth. Enough is enough. If that was going to work, that would have worked. Oi, oi vey, as, as my grandparents would say. Oi, oi gavalta. Love your page. Helps me with addressing trauma for me a lot. Good. Good. I'm glad you get to be a part of the journey with you. I need to seek truth. Don't all people need to seek truth? I think I think that's what a lot of religions kind of have. That That's what the point of them is, was to try to teach isolated farming communities how to seek mutual meaning and truth together. And I think the New Testament has a really overt way of talking about that, like seek truth. Um, and I'm not like a New Testament uh, specialist or anything. I'm, I'm a Jewish guy. I know a lot about a lot more about the Old Testament <laughs> when it comes down to it. But at, at the end of the day, it's about seeking truth. So uh, to kind of think about that um, as, a, as a family therapist and someone who works with interpersonal relationships, so much of it is about building mutual trust and understanding within the dialogue. And a lot of stuff these days is so cut up by all these social and cultural expectations and by trauma histories based on tribalism and BS about consumer culture that folks get really uh, stuck in, in these places where um, we're not seeking truth that actually fulfills a, a sense of purpose and, and meaningfully uh, serving while seeking that process, while hunting as a dynamic pack, which is what human beings evolved to do. This is what brought us out of the trees and into the grasslands. And especially now as we're becoming more of a global community, this tribalism stuff like this, we can't we can't keep doing this. Like we are we, we've heard it from spiritual leaders for you know hundreds of years now. These concepts of one love, monotheism tried to do it. I think Buddhism tried to talk about these concepts of like it's that everything is nothing with a twist. Like we're all connected, you as me. Um, it, it's time to really practice what we preach now, and the the, the next level of evolution, I think, as, as, a, as a species, has to do with our spiritual evolution, being able to understand and see these uh, interconnected pieces between you and me, and it's always we, and, and that, that's, that's how it's going to have to be if we're going to survive this thing. Yeah, wow, community. I wasn't raising community. My dad was very abusive until I was 21, right? And a lot of the experiences that we have, and especially with trauma, are going to leave us with impacts that convince us that chronic self-soothing and chronic self-neglect are the only ways to, to, to regulate ourselves, which really set us up to, to get sick with autoimmune illness, to, to uh, dehumanize each other and to, to hurt each other, to harm ourselves. It, it, it is not, uh, not high vibe-ish, as, as they would say. And I can talk about it at the, you know, talk about upper level psychology. We can do that. We can talk about it as uh, in terms of some you know, spiritual concepts. We can do that too. It's, I think it's all trying to speak to the same truths. I carry people's energy all the time. I need to learn to let it go. I'm sure you learned how to do that um, compulsive, hypervigilant empathizing for a reason. I'm sure it served you very well. You wouldn't do it for no reason. I'd, I'd already feel bad. There's like over 100 messages stacked up in the Q&A. Again, if you write them in the comments, I'll see them. If they're in the Q&A, it's just a lot going back and forth, and I start missing things. So um, uh, again, I'm sorry if you spent a ton of energy pumping questions in the q and I'm, I'm not gonna see them, send them into the, the, the live comments or into my DMs if you are not comfortable sharing them openly. I wanna be of service to you. Last two months breaking down with memories, painful memories. This is, this is grieving, it is okay to, it is okay to have pain. It's okay, it sucks, it hurts. It's, it's okay to hurt too, it's, it's okay. It, it sucks, I'm sorry. Please explain why there are bouts of such compassion and then manipulation or gaslighting. Because no one would stick around if there wasn't compassion. It's a cycle. It's a cycle of abuse. That's what it is. 
and that that's a, another reason that the the narcissistic abuse thing kind of drives me a little bonky a little like wonky do that, that kind of leaves people hanging is that the that discard phase it just kind of went in and renamed a bunch of stuff that's been a part of domestic violence prevention work for decades and one is this cycle of violence where you have baseline then it goes into tension building and you have the outburst and then it goes into a honeymoon phase love bombing and then it goes into baseline usually 90 to 95 percent of the rela uh, relationship at times can be in the baseline tension building and the outburst in this cycle right so in 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 narcissistic abuse circles i say that's the discard and then they hoover back or something but really it's a part of domestic violence and sometimes people get out of there and sometimes they don't. Um, and people would not stick around if it was just the bullshit, if it was just the assholery, if it was just the violence, whether emotional and psychological or physical or sexual or whatever. What advice do you give someone with guilt and regret after a couple of sibling suicide? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that question. That's a very difficult question to ask. Um, and, and also I want to be clear with y'all, some folks have seen you're very hesitant to ask about suicide, even say the word suicide and folks being, they feel like you're, it looks like people are kind of walking on eggshells or like, you know, walking on uh, um, ice, on an icy pond, trying to figure out how to talk about that and hear it heard other folks saying unalive. Um, it's, so it's not okay to say commit suicide. You don't, we, you don't say that because th that's attached to uh suicide and taking of one's life as being a, a sin as connected to uh, some some religious stuff you know, c commit a sin that's what it's you commit if you you complete suicide so you, you, suicide is just something that it is something that happens is awful and we got to talk about it but it, it is it is a word we, we can't cancel the word suicide you, you know we don't need to do that um, so with guilt and regret after a couple of siblings suicide it's it's your natural like you're, you're, I'm a, it's fucking awful, and I'm really sorry that you experienced that, especially a couple of siblings. What, and I'm gonna go ahead and assume that whatever y'all dealt with as a cohort together was probably really intense. I'm sorry about that too, and I would imagine almost like, you know, folks who come back from war together, y'all are probably really tight. Sorry, um, I wish I knew the perfect thing to say, but I've, I've never experienced that before. Um, I think it probably says through, uh, through through my eyes getting full that you know maybe that your feelings are not that weird or invalid that you're stuck there. Like I it kind of wrenched my heart, and it's not my life. I can't imagine what it feels like for you. So I want you to give yourself space and permission to feel and talk to people that you love. And I hope that you're seeing a therapist because I, I, I'm going to go ahead and assume that some of the stuff that y'all dealt with as a cohort was just downright effery, like not even assholery, effery. And, and that's jacked. Oh, you're a survivor, sister. Can people who are emotionally abusive change? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another, the, the ugh, can't be like a, it, uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, they have to, to want to change uh, for reasons that make sense to them. But yes, uh, and the, the, it's almost like uh, with addiction though, um, when someone with domestic violence stuff and abusive folks is, it's not possible unless other people are participating in it. So it tends to be locked in. It, it's, a, uh, it's a behavioral health and health condition that is a family systems issue. Because it, you know, it always, it's, there are a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, and, and in a lot of different ways, uh, folks who are, are abusive and abusers and perpetrators I mean, in domestic violence are, are addicted to controlling their partner in a very similar way that you would see with addiction to substances and any kind of behavioral compulsion. You know, that's why they'll like kill people getting to their their target like they they just have like blinders for it and it's um it, it can get that intense the cycle between compassion and manipulation and how abusers groom their victims to say yeah you said they said it much better no one would stay if they were never nice it's the process sending healing energy to anyone who needs it mm. 
and I wasn't being like making funny. I was like for 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 legit for reals for reals. Um, how do you get over the fear of being with another abusive person? You you do your healing work and you set your boundaries and you start dating and you hold yourself accountable. And when when you're ready to do that, but if if you're really just if if you're super scared that you're gonna lose control in in dating another person, then you probably don't need to at least be in a committed relationship for a while. Can we at least you know uh, uh, agree on that? Um, maybe you can just kind of go date folks for a little bit and have you know casual interactions with folks I'm not even saying that you should make yourself sexually available to them that's not what I'm hinting at just like date people and do whatever the heck you want to as a grown a adult user nondescript name who I couldn't pull any kind of gender stuff from um, you know, do, do whatever the heck you want that, that makes you happy and then when and if you're ready to commit to people uh, you know, wait until you meet someone that you're not scared of. I think it goes without, without being said, but yeah. I'm new on TikTok, and this is my first live to watch. Cool. I uh, hope this um, helped you have positive experiences with live streams. That's funny to me. Like, the f you go on TikTok, and the first thing you see is some Gen Xer talking about super serious ish. <laughs> I think you're, you're probably, if you're still here, you're having a really non-typical TikTok experience, I think. I think. I don't know. Uh, the, um, some some hearts floating up there that uh, it's look like they agreed with me. Um, I'm pretty sure my ex is Asperger's and a narcissist. Those are generally two diagnoses that do not go along with each other. Just saying. Uh, diagnostically speaking. Your videos have been so helpful. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Honored to be a small part of the journey with you. How do I open up to a community without the fear of being hurt and abandoned? That's the buy-in at the table. Sorry to be the bearer of that news, uh, but that's, that, 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 that's how you sit down at the poker table. If, if you wanna see the river, you gotta play to get there. And, and if you're feeling really scared of being hurt or abandoned again, I'm sure it's for good reason. You did not deserve whatever you ran into up to this point that, that did not do justice to, to your need to, to trust yourself and trust the world. But from this position, what you get to control is, is redeveloping that faith in yourself by setting some achievable goals and getting out there on a consistent basis to start knocking those out and taking some calculated risks um, so you can start redeveloping you know, your comfort with yourself so you can get out there and start learning how to trust those wings again Not be so dependent on focusing on if, if the branch is gonna break or not like if the branch breaks the branch breaks eh. You know we'll find another branch be okay your wings though they purr me they purr me Genius. Thanks. Love this page. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do to help people understand trauma. I appreciate all your advice Dolly Molly Lolly I, I like your handle, it makes me laugh. And I've appreciated your comments and how they've kind of developed also in, in the last few months. Um, I know, I'm like I remember, I remember people by their comments and <laughs> how like the level of insight you have when you ask the questions and how presuppositional you are leading up. And it's really fun to watch y'all develop as you ask the questions and want and, and assume less and are curious about more. It's just, it's fucking cool. It's so cool to be so cool to be a part of, of all this stuff with y'all as a therapist. I love your content. Dope. That's awesome to hear. There there are a lot of healthcare professionals that that follow me. Um, I want to look strong for my daughters, but feeling I'm doing wrong. It's okay to feel bad sometimes. It is absolutely okay to feel bad sometimes, Mama Bear. Um, that's that's how they learn that they have permission to feel bad too. That's how they learn that they get to be fallible too. And when they when they get to see you be sad and and uh, or or be scared, probably not scared a whole lot with, with them openly. But when they get to see you be fallible and still execute and look out for them, uh, that that helps them see much more of your full range of resilience as a human being. And that that's that's what. 
really models a strong character to our children. Am I weird or are you just ASIC? What's ASIC? A-S-I-C? Sorry, I'm not, I'm, what is ASIC? What are some things to start journaling? Uh, talk about your strong reactions to things. Talk about, um, yeah, strong thoughts and feelings. Talk about conflicts with people. Uh, if you feel like you had a, a, a bad day, like it, allow yourself to, to ruminate. Like when you get notably upset about something is, is when you need to be writing. So you can start you know, for slowing down um, the, the, the thoughts and, and, and getting a better handle on them as well as starting to look for some of these patterns. And over time, you're going to see patterns, whether it's, gosh, when I start, it's always super pessimistic. And then I've usually found a little bit of, of gray by the time I get to the end. Or if it's, hey, I'm usually having intrusive thoughts about this type of theme. Or you start looking at the time and date of your journal entries and like, damn, it's always after I'm meeting with this person. I always knew it, Newman, or like, you know, whatever it is. And you, you can, but journaling is human being, like we're having, we have so many... <laughs> thoughts and feelings about stuff all the time that we're barely consciously aware of and a lot of it w would never be consciously aware of so when we start putting paper to the pen it's almost like lucid dreaming practices you start practice it's like mindful thinking uh for, for the, the rest of y your day um and you start you're like is this something i would journal about i don't know and it creates a different kind of meta-analysis with how you're going to be experiencing the rest of your your, your uh, um you know existence in your worldview and there, there's this uh, old Austrian inventor, I think in the, ni the 19th century, late 19th century, said, uh, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts. And I think journaling, good time-stamped journaling, is a really good job for doing this with, with us being really abstract, kind of really flowingly, intellectually flowingly creatures. We can capture as much data as possible. I feel sad when I hear people say to leave the narcissist. Does that mean that they do life alone? Uh, usually people who legit have narcissistic personality disorder drive everyone else away and eventually they are alone. Um, now, most of the time, people that are doing these power and control tactics tend to have other stuff going on, like untreated addiction, depression, anxiety, or whatever. And it, it, their, their, their stuff is coming out in part as projections onto folks around them. And stuff is, t you can totally treat a lot of that stuff. And it, it really kind of breaks my heart when I hear a lot of the narrative around saying like, in, anybody that's doing any of this, it's always called narcissistic abuse. And that means that they're narcissists, which means that they can never change. That, that also leaves a lot on the table with uh, folks who can be a part of the solution, at least, you know, stop harming people. Um, the DSM-5 does not talk about trauma bond. Nope, doesn't yet. There's uh, still other uh, peer-reviewed, evidence-based research about it. Loaded with trauma. What's the path to work through it? Um... Uh, read The Body Keeps Score and take it from there. There's this book called The Body Keeps Score by Dr. Van Kolk. I would start there and then decide what you want to do. I realize now that my ex is neurodivergent. Explains so much, right? Research suggests over and over again that when someone has executive processing issues, or if, before they used to be called developmental delays, which I'm glad we're starting to move away from, even though our the fun DSM-5 still calls it that, right? It doesn't doesn't mean it's like the 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 Old Testament and, and God like wrote the, this effing commandments in it and, and Moses marched it up Sinai. It's, it's 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 a collection of fucking science and it continues to evolve and change. Um, and thank thank God, right? Um, and research shows over and over again that for family members and loved ones, just understanding what they can do, what they can't do, what is related to their executive processing, uh, uh, difference and divergence versus who they are as a human and who they think about us as a human, the better. Um, and this goes for families and romantic relationships as well. How to protect yourself from manipulative people, emotional abuse, healthy boundaries, healthy boundaries and, uh, following through with them. 
the people who are takers and manipulative won't be able to, to hang in your wavelength. Sometimes you can even see it in how I respond to, to comments. If people have really presuppositional comments, um, you'll see me asking open-ended questions with kind of Socratic reasoning and kind of giving them a chance to backpedal and think about where they're coming from. And then if they just go all in, I either just stop engaging with them or just say, hey, just clarify, this is, that's not correct, <laughs> just for anyone else watching this, and, and then stop there. And if they really come out as, as jerks, um, I'll, I'll do a video like I did several days ago of uh, uh, the, the, the Cinda F and Rella. <laughs> Right? It was like, hey, dude, you're, you're obviously hanging out in projection station right now, and, you know, and if, if, if you want a handful of, of, uh, of the sauce, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a handful of the sauce, but you're, you're the one snooping around here um, and not rescuing people from that. And I'm not being mean about it. It's just like, dude, <laughs> like, look what you just stepped in. That's all over you. That has nothing to do with anybody else and they're gonna stop engaging because they, like, they're gonna try to do some smear tactics, like you're a nurse, or like whatever, afterwards we just like don't engage, they stop engaging. It is all uh, rhythms, the, the message that we're gonna send with what we're doing, seeing if someone is willing or capable of seeking truth with us and, and deciding to uh, artfully, strategically, uh, varying degrees of gracefully, uh, not give a fuck if they don't care about us, but only to the point of doing no harm. Um, and that's part of where those healthy boundaries are so helpful. It's, it's all focused on how we're going to take care of ourselves. It, it doesn't really involve that much um, our, uh, uh, how nice or not nice we're going to be to other people. If, if, if they can hang with our self-love, then they can hang. As someone who grew up in an abusive home, I'm grateful for you educating people on trauma. Honored to, to be a part of the, the Great Awakening. So I think, I, think we're, I think we're coming to, I don't think it's revelations. Uh, uh, uh. I think, it's, I think it's, it is a different story. That, 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 whatever story it is, we're writing it right now. That's, that's the beautiful thing about it. Best way to overcome abandonment issues. Um, Redevelop trust in your own in your own rhythms and, and, and self-love and the life of purpose and living your life by your own core values and falling in love with with your own daily act of dating yourself and uh, you know eventually you won't be as scared of losing other people and then you start to, to get out there and when you see that uh, and, and start to experiment with it you know um, figure out where, where those came from and how you're prone to getting triggered in your own life and course correcting those and practicing walking them back so you can reclaim that, uh, that energy for yourself. You're not gonna be left to uh, uh, chase someone who is withdrawing from you. It's now two years since I separated from my narcissist hubby and I'm so glad he left. You know, if you were, I think what you're describing is an abusive relationship and, and I'm totally glad you're out of that too. Reactive abuse is not something to feel guilty for, but it is something to need to work on. Yes, it's not something to feel guilty for. It is absolutely something to work on for a lot of different reasons. Um, but if 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 you're um, you know if you're dealing with with reactive abuse in your life, there's probably a whole lot of stuff going on in your life that you don't necessarily need to feel guilty or ashamed about. That you probably do. Tips on calming your nervous system when it's the last thing you want to do. Forcing yourself to do it and holding yourself accountable to it. I mean, really, if it's the last thing that you want to do, then that probably means that it's the first thing that you need to do. Because that, that's usually how the human brain works. We really want to avoid stuff that we see is high stakes or that, th especially th if we have a lot of trauma history, that throws us off from self-sabotaging. I think it's the last thing that you want to do because you're hyper-focused, like laser-focused in on whatever's triggered you and you're going in for a compulsion to repeat. So of course you don't want to stop. You're like a bulldog that has, thinks he sees a bull. And I, I feel you, I'm sure it's there for a good reason. I've been there, sometimes I am there. Um, however, 
judging from your comments in the past, you're, you're like kind of, you're, you're a marshmallow. Like you're, you're one of the good guys. You're a well-meaning dude. And I think you're a sweet bulldog. I don't think you want to hit a bull. And if you do, I think you want to know that you're serving meaningfully and playing for the good guys team. So usually the, the thing that we want to do the least is, is, is if we know it's good for us is usually the thing that we need to do the most. It kind of gets back, you've heard this old saying in Buddhism, the, the times that you want to meditate the least are the times that you need to meditate the most. It's, it's you know, the times that you want to get vulnerable the least are probably the times that you should get vulnerable the most. The times, it kind of, it can go on and on and on and on, and on right? Uh, Google dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness skills. Yes, lots of, uh, or things besides meditation. Um, music, breathing, uh, uh, course correcting the intrusive thoughts, arguing back with them. Really at the end of the day, if you are getting triggered and your central nervous system is getting really dysregulated, there's no way around mindfulness. You're going to have to learn that through whatever avenue that you go through in order to reclaim your central nervous system. So Fender Bits, Faux Twins, if there's anything that I want you to do after this is I want you to do a body scan. I want you to get online, I want you to go on YouTube and look up a body scan. It's a very, uh, oh, thank you, you know, a little heart came in. It's a very um, goal-oriented walk you through uh, uh, tuning into your physical body and, and, and almost kind of you know, the same as if you'd be working out, you have like a mind-muscle connection. You can do that in a ton of different ways. And I want you to go check that out and let me know how that hits. That's how you start. It took seven years of meditation practice. Write a lot, like it's it, practice, practice y'all. Kids grow up in the Far East having a different type of meditation as their rotating PE class. Like it, it is a part of, and it, it has been for thousands of years, Western culture really devalues it. It doesn't look productive. You, you can't build a, a, the utopian city upon a hill while meditating. You can't uh, do all these consumer culture BS things while meditating. It's, it's nice to have nice things, and, and especially in a capitalist economy, you need to have enough to be able to take care of yourself with just medical stuff. Like you know, the Most people that are, become homeless, it's initially through uh, medical bills in this country. It's like a freaking joke. However, when it gets beyond that, dialing in what we decide is important and not in our life is, is incredibly essential for human beings, and especially in a culture that really wants to convince us to go chase and money is numbers and numbers never end and buy a bunch of crap to line the pockets of executives. Does anyone really heal? Hell yeah. I really healed. Uh, I was grew, grew up as a, a kid in an abusive household. Um, started drinking every night to go to sleep by the time I was 12. And I think like 14 or 15, I couldn't go to school without being good and stoned. And it was just kind of off to the races from then. Um, most of my friends died from addiction and overdose stuff that I grew up with. That was a part of why I started creating the Balanced Man Plan, because I was even having friends die that I grew up with that weren't asking me for help and knew I was a therapist and still couldn't do it for, for a lot of other reasons that I'm not going to go into here quite yet. But um, there, there is a, a such thing as post-traumatic growth. Um, my, my grandfather healed, who was an Auschwitz survivor, uh, who was rescued by Oskar Schindler. He was a very generous, kind, beautiful man. Um, uh, a lot of people heal. Uh, a lot of times not by doing traditional stuff that, that we're taught to expect in the medical community. Uh, but, but yeah. And I, th I think some what, some part that has made it difficult, too, is in modern society, in these modern concrete jungles, we, we tend to be so separated out from how we're supposed to be living our daily lives as human beings that the impacts of those events are even that more destructive to our psyche because we're, we're less resilient. Um, however, by, by learning how to live in this more dynamic fashion, having a purpose-driven life, um, having a tight inner circle, and being very intentional about how we move in these spaces and only... Uh, surrounding ourselves with people that share those parts of our personal integrity so that we can seek meaning and truth together and hunt as a dynamic pack how we were designed to come out of the trees and, and dominate the grasslands as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a human race or as one race. Like, 
Okay, let's be real. Um, we, we are meant to be incredibly resilient. We've been going through all kinds of stuff. However, it's going to depend on our ability to, to lean into all of that again. And there are a lot of the powers that be that uh, block us from doing that and teach us to, um, to consume, 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 and to objectify ourselves uh, more and more. How do you stop people's judgments from affecting you? I feel so many raw emotions. You practice. You start journaling about them. Notice when you're doing it. Notice the times that trigger you to do it the most. Um, and, and really, you're, you're saying that you're worried about their judgments. They're actually your judgments. Sorry. But they're, they're your judgments. You're projecting them onto them. So learning to navigate why you're having those feelings in those spaces and what that is about for you and where those come from and healing from that and developing self-awareness about that because what you're experiencing with other people is projective. That doesn't mean you're a narcissist. Everybody has projective experiences. It's part of that being an egocentric species. How do you stop? Okay, hi from upstate New York. What's up, upstate? Howdy, howdy. Thanks, bro. I will check this out some more later. Right on. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You are so supportive. Um, healing. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. How do I deal with people I live with who constantly gaslight and try to make me look crazy? Engage less. Care less. Plan your own shit more. Store resources and plan an exit route. Is it starts strategically giving less F's, start practicing grounding yourself. Um, even if it just starts with like deciding that someone's going to be, when they're gearing up to be a, an ass, if you know that you're stuck in the position you are, I mean, just like concentrate on a mole on their face and just like be there. If you know that you have to be there to be safe, you know, once you get through it, okay, we, you know, got it. And start learning how to distance yourself emotionally from those spaces. Um, that that you know th those are options too. I've uh, distanced myself from family for peace, and my family doesn't like it. Never win. They don't have to like it now, do they? That's the beauty. That's the beauty. They ain't, they ain't never had to like it anyway, did they? Well, I guess they did when we were kids. That's what made it so freaking complicated. That's why those layers of shame got, got overladen onto even challenging at all because the, those layers of shame were prote protecting us as survival responses. But now you're through it. They don't like it anymore. So as long as you're doing no harm, not allowing them to harm themselves, but you doing no harm, fuck them. You have helped me. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor to be a small part of your journey with you. Interpersonal effectiveness with DBT helps in those situations. Yes, DBT is the bee's knees. Love me some DBT. Setting boundaries is hard, but living with boundaries is easy. I like how you said that. Setting a boundary is hard, but living with boundaries is easy. Once you internalize those rhythms as the way that you operate, is what I'm seeing you describing, it feels so much more natural. And yeah, and that, that's where the law of attraction actually starts to come in and work in, in your benefit, right? Because like those, those boundaries like set off, if you're consistent enough, you almost emit this wavelength that only like high vibe people can roll with. People that are coming in there to be takers realize that they're going to have, they're going to get called to the carpet and they're just, they're not, they, they might come test you for a minute and then you'd be like, yeah, no thanks. And they're going to be like, oh my God, because internally they're incredibly insecure. And once they realize they couldn't take you and they, they're not in control, they're going to totally back off and not want anything to do with you because you're intimidating. So how do you heal from parentifying? So in short, parentification is the process, this role reversal where kids learn that it's their responsibility to become the uh, sometimes emotional companion, sometimes even functional companion or caretaker for the household. What happens in that situation is we never get to experience a lot of pieces of childhood and we experience a lot of what is seen as emotional neglect. However, on the surface can appear to meet the social and cultural thresholds for being you know, good enough, meeting your needs household. So it can be really hard to see those happening on the surface. But a lot of times, you know, folks who come from alcoholic families with high functioning parents professionally have a lot of this stuff going on. Or you know, any kind of chronic health conditions have this stuff going on. And 
So what happens is, is your inner child is left like totally undeveloped. And what, what you have to do is really in line with a lot of the other trauma stuff and out, amounts to is doing the shadow work to get to the inner child. And then you have to learn literally to be who you needed when you were younger while never having a model and actually being modeled how not to do it, being modeled the, the, the effed way to do it, like the wrong way to do it. That's why everything's not working. So it, uh, uh, it tends to, you, you can do a lot of reading about this kind of stuff. I would start with kids and alcoholic families. Um, there's also a book called uh, The Drama of the Gifted Child that I would recommend that you check out by, a, um, I always confuse her and Alice Walker, uh, who's a, a very, very famous author. That this woman is not anywhere on the level of that she's like different genres, um, but her name is Alice Miller. Uh, the drama of the gifted child. Uh, start there, uh, or you could read almost anything about children of alcoholic families. It's gonna vibe with you. Is it possible to be emotionally neglected yet not remember? Yes, it's very common. Like, what are you gonna remember? Like taking care of other people when you didn't realize that that's what you were doing, or that it was taboo to remember it like that. Yeah, that when, when there are more obvious experiences of, of abuse and, and assault, we, th those sometimes we repress those, but a lot of times we tend to remember pieces of them when we know those happen. This other stuff can be really hard to identify because it shows up as not, it's not physical, it shows up as, again, these, right? And those of us that grow up with these and being gaslighted by our parents, your parents are gonna be your first buddies or your first bullies, then we grow up and we start looking for those similar dynamics. And, it, and it's not that we necessarily attract narcissists. I'm not gonna say like, you're not attractive. I'm sure you're beautiful. Um, but the, they're, they, they're, they realize at some point that they can take advantage. So they start doing that, whoever sticks around. But again, most people that, have, you know, our, our abusers or treat people with that level of assholery uh, tend to drive people away. Anyone else around is, is a target. All right, I got time for one more question and then I'm gonna jump in for the rest of my evening uh, with uh, my, my partner, my wife as a, uh, a husband and daddy and all that good stuff. Uh, but I really enjoy continuing to do these with y'all. I want to make sure I pick a good one here at the end. What do y'all, they're all good questions, but make sure I pitch, pick a rich one, a dynamic one. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll answer this. Bela, you, you, you've asked some great questions, you've given some great insight, and I want to meet you where you're at here. You say, do you have your own experience with trauma that helps with insight talking about this? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm a childhood abuse survivor, um, the, the oldest, kid in the family of a, a younger brother and part that uh, the whole the the video that I did the other day about like wishing sometimes we have a dream that someone comes and saves us and someone made a comment like what about if I always dreamed about the person saving I, I commented back like a piece of self-disclosure that's a common variation and that's that's my variation too that's it's got the part of what drives all this probably at that at some level um, and I, the, the position that I had growing up was I was the, the truth teller and the scapegoat, and they tend to go along, um, as well as uh, the, the abuser's emotional companion. So it was my, my job to pacify this person who was really chaotic and out of control and an addict and hurting people um, and kind of judge if they, if, if I could, either get them cued in on me and get a situation off of other people or if I could help them get more inebriated and get them knocked out or whatever the heck it is. And from a really early age, I've been, um, I've had a layer of hypervigilance over this stuff. I, I understand how it functions. Um, and then in, in my early 20s, uh, went to go work in a wilderness therapy setting with at-risk youth. Um, after I finished my undergraduate studies and fell in love with the work and, and got sober and started doing my own work and stayed in, in this uh, the Appalachian wilderness for three years, uh, working with, you know, like 15, 17 year olds who wanted to kill me most of the time and absolutely loved it because apparently I'm a weirdo. 
uh, met the person who would uh, later be uh, marry, uh, be my wife, and start a beautiful family with. And then we went off to, to Portland, and uh, Portland, Oregon, where I got a master's degree before coming back down south um, to live in, in you know, Charlotte, not too far from the Appalachian Mountains that I fell in love with, and not too far away from the coast where I can go surf and hang out in the waves and uh, frolic with, with my kiddos and uh, do some fun stuff that, uh, some of the fun things that I remember doing as a kid that, that got to be a part of it too. You know, it's, it wasn't all, all awful, but there, there were those parts that I do understand in, in some ways more than, um, more than is going to be in a book. Uh, however, over the years, um, I'm starting to find that the research that we're seeing about this stuff is finally starting to reflect uh, a level of uh, a subjective experience that I'm uh, familiar with that is, uh, feels very natural to describe to people. You hear me talking about stuff, um, <laughs> the, the, you know, that's, that's why it probably sounds so stripped down and raw in, in a lot of different ways because it just kind of just kind of is. Um, but that's, that's who I am. Uh, the, those parts of me, at least. Um, glad that you felt comfortable enough with asking. And I was, uh, you know, again, um, please, as as you want to know, whatever, ask. You know, because I'm not I'm not your therapist necessarily. Um, I'm a, a I'm a coach. I'm a, a I guess I'm an influencer. I'm just freaking weird to think about. It. I don't want to be it. Maybe I, I I don't know. Whatever the heck that is. Um, but I'm not not your therapist, so none of, neither of us are um, bound by those uh, uh, boundaries necessarily. Um, in so far as like ask me whatever you want to, like it, if if it's too much, I'll say that's too much. I'm not going to answer. But and if it's not, like I, I want to help you get it, and I want to help you understand where I'm coming from, so we can mutually seek truth and understanding together. So. Again, everybody, thank you so much for uh, liking, commenting, uh, sharing posts, joining us for this live stream as we share this journey together. Uh, please check out the website at the link in the bio if you have any other questions or want to see any of the uh, any other of the offerings that we have. Um, some really inexpensive stuff, as well as uh, free blogs, very extensive blog page, um, as well as some apparel. Have some you know, cool like t-shirts, hats, and, and gaiters to take some of our messages out into the world. Uh, to, to do no harm with the power of love and uh, take no shit by avoiding the love of power. Um, and also have an Instagram page that's been rocking since like 2018. It's linked in the bio. You can check that out. Um, follow us for you know, more content again, um, as well as a YouTube channel with other stuff where we upload some of these uh, talks. If you've enjoyed this talk, um, hearing past talks and hearing me rapping with people and answering questions and, and, and doing doing whatever, whenever, wherever, because it's, you know, seems like the right thing to do. So in the meantime, you'll keep your body healthy and keep your mind aligned with your purpose and your people. Peace.